Welcome to Nursing School Explained in this video on disseminated intravascular coagulopathy or sometimes also abbreviated as DIC. Again, we can look at the terminology here to really almost get a better understanding of what's the underlying pathophysiology. So disseminated basically just means widespread throughout an organ or the body intravascular within the blood vessels, and coagulopathy, so a disease or a problem with the coagulation. And really what it is, is an abnormal response of the normal coagulation cascade. And you may remember from physiology all the different steps that happen in the coagulation cascade and the different factors that are involved. And so DIC just involves a very abnormal response to the coagulation cascade as it should naturally occur. Now, several things can cause DIC, and all of those um, are similar yet very different, but they all lead to the same end result, which is this complication that can be life-threatening. So very common causes are any kind of shock states that the patient can be in. So neurogenic shock, hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic shock, uh, any kind of shock that you can imagine. And then sepsis is a very common cause of DIC, as well as transfusion reactions can lead to coagulation problems and DIC. And then there are several um, gynecological or obstetrical things that can lead to DIC. First of all is HELP syndrome. Then we have amniotic fluid emboli or an abruption of the placenta can all lead to abnormal clotting and DIC. Now certainly blood disorders such as leukemia or metastatic tumors can also lead to DIC. Burns as well as trauma can cause a problem and snake bites that are poisonous can lead to issues with coagulation and DIC and acute anoxia such as would occur after uh, a patient returns to spontaneous circulation after a cardiac arrest, or maybe after an acute drowning when the patient is revived and has acute anoxia, it can also lead to DIC. So as you can see, most of these are already kind of um, very high risk events that can lead to this complication that then exasperates the problem. So the pathophysiology, there are basically two things that occur here. So first of all, we have the thrombotic stage, which is the problem of the clotting. So if you recall from your physiology classes that thrombin is needed to convert fibrin to fibrinogen to actually build the blood clot. Um, and this leads to increased platelet aggregation because the platelets want to solve the problem of um, this, uh, whatever needs to be fixed. And then a thrombus occurs, which is usually a good thing, but in this case, it's just too much of a good thing. So now we have thrombi um, everywhere in the body and they can settle and then cause a lot of complications. And then number two, we have the bleeding stage or the bleeding phase, where now these clots are bro broken down by something called fibrin split products or FSP. And then the body is unable to clot because all everything is used up, all these platelets are used up, and whatever clots we have, they're broken down, and the body cannot clot, which then will lead to hemorrhage. So it's kind of a conundrum. We have clotting and bleeding at the same time, and we know that either one of them can be very complicated to manage, but now we have these two problems that can sometimes occur at the very same time in the same patient. So signs and symptoms that we might see, and I have um, distinguished here between bleeding and clotting issues. So in the skin, when the patient is bleeding, there might be pallor because there might be blood loss, as well as petechiae and purpura as the blood vessels underneath the skin start to leak, and we can see the, the, the blood basically accumulating there and petechiae are just small dots where purpura can be kind of more uh, blotchy as that blood leaks underneath the skin. Now in clotting under the skin we might see cyanosis because now there's a clot preventing the blood flow to get to a certain area but it can also lead to gangrenous um, issues such as lost toes, lost fingers or maybe even limbs. 
In the respiratory system, when there's a problem with the bleeding, we will see an increase in respiratory rate, maybe hemoptysis, as the patient, um, as the patient's lungs get affected, and certainly they can be short of breath. Um, but if we have a problem with clotting, it can lead to PE, pulmonary emboli that can settle in the lung, and also um, ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. In the cardiovascular system, when there is bleeding, the heart rate will usually go up as the blood pressure drops and the patient loses the blood volume. And then when there's clotting, we can see EKG changes because clotting affecting the heart can lead to myocardial infarction, but then also to heart failure and JVD that we can see. Um, in the bleeding phase, the patient might have GI bleeding, so blood in the vomitus, so coffee ground emesis, as well as rectal bleeding. But in the clotting phase, the patient might be complaining of abdominal pain. And because of the lack of blood, that's the blood flow that's caused to the GI system, now there might be a paralytic ileus because we just don't have the blood to feed the GI system to do its normal function. Uh, in the GU system, we might have hematuria, so bleeding in the urinary tract. And that can lead to oliguria as well as renal failure. Now, in the neurologic system, when there is bleeding, we may have altered level of consciousness, or so the patient might be complaining of vision changes. And then in the clotting phase, of course, blood clots in the brain will lead to TIAs and CVAs. And then also in the musculoskeletal system, um, a phenomenon occurs that is called heme arthrosis. So now the blood will kind of settle in the joints that can be very, become very swollen as they become inundated with the blood and then um, cause a lot of pain there in the joints. So now looking at uh, diagnostic tests, certainly we wanna look at their CBC to see well, how their blood count's doing, CMP to look at their kidney and liver function as well as electrolytes. And then everything that pertains to the coagulation cascade. So we want to look at their bleeding times, PTI and R, at their fibrinogen level, plasminogen level, their platelets are certainly going to be important to measure, as well as their D-dimer, but keep in mind that's a very non-specific marker of clotting. And then we can actually measure these fibrin spit products that we worry about so much here in their blood system as well. And there might be other special clotting tests that the provider might order. As for treatment, we need to treat the underlying cause. There's nothing we can do unless we treat the underlying cause. So if the patient is septic, we need to give them antibiotics, determine the cause of the sepsis, uh, give them lots and lots of fluids. Um, if they had a snake bite, certainly we're gonna, we're gonna treat that because those are very different causes all leading to the same problem, but the treatment will be very different depending on where the origin of this DIC is. And then we certainly will always worry about oxygen administration and the patient's airway because we saw over here what can happen if there's bleeding in the respiratory tract or they might be developing a PE or ARDS. And then certainly we want to replace their volume because as they bleed and clot, um, they might, as they, as they bleed more, so they will lose their volume, so we might need to replace it with crystalloids to begin with, so IV solutions that will stay in that intravascular space, helping to maintain their blood pressure, and then we will need to administer blood products, and those are anything that you can think of that we can give to the patient, so anything from packed red blood cells, if they've lost a lot of their blood volume, as well as platelets, um, uh, fresh frozen plasma, and then we can also give them certain coagulation factors if they are lacking in certain coagulation factors. So this is probably the, the most important part here. And then if there's clotting, if we see a lot of evidence of signs and symptoms of clotting here, the patient might be on a heparin drip to prevent the clotting and then, or be on Lovenox. And as you can see here, it's a little bit of a conundrum because we want to prevent the clotting, but we also want to um, give the patient these products. So there's a, there's a fine line between the bleeding and the clotting, and depending on what their labs show, how the patient looks, is what, they'll, um, what kind of a treatment that they'll need, whether they'll need one or the other, or maybe a, a, a very careful administration of both. Now for nursing care, uh, certainly all the treatments that would happen for these other 
this underlying disorders or, or causes of DIC, but it's very important to identify patients at risk. So to be familiar with these disorders and know that if you have an obstetrical patient who have an amniotic fluid embolus, that they are at high risk for developing DIC and to really monitor them very, very carefully for bleeding from the IV sites, for example, for starting to the bleeding gums, GI bleeding, just a pink tinged urine, anything that would hint to the fact that there might be some DIC developing. Because of course, the sooner you recognize the symptoms, the sooner the patient can be treated and the better their outcome will be. Um, with this careful monitoring and intervening early. So thank you for watching on this video on DIC. Please also watch the other videos to, about any of these disorders that can lead to DIC so you have a better understanding of how it really all relates together. Thanks for watching Nursing School Explained. See you soon.